Every day, somewhere in the world, normal people risk their lives just getting from A to B. In far off countries and isolated forgotten villages, our camera crews follow the journeys of those brave enough to travel on the world's toughest, most dangerous and deadly roads. Buckle up for a hell ride. This is Deadliest Journeys. At a glance, this place may look like a shabby junkyard, but it is, in fact, the port of Kinshasa, one of the biggest cities in Africa. Tons of rice, palm oil and spices are transported by hand since the decrepit old harbour cranes have long since stopped working. Amidst this chaos is the Bear Marnie, a freighter that also crams on passengers for an extra buck. There are no cabins or seats and the passengers have to scramble for a decent perch for their long journey. Everyone squeezes on board and the Bear Marnie soon resembles a floating slum. There are 800 people on board, people off to visit their relatives, attend a marriage or a funeral. Others dream of making their fortune and are heading for the diamond mines on the other side of the country. Whatever the reason, they're in for over a thousand miles of misery as this old boat snakes its way through the heart of Africa. From Kinshasa all the way to Kisangani, the country's third largest city. Before he sets sail, the captain squeezes out a quick prayer. Seigneur, à ce moment, je prends possession de ces bateaux au nom puissant de Jésus. Je anéantis toute puissance du diable, du Satan. Je les repousse au nom puissant de Jésus et je prends possession de ces bateaux au nom de Jésus. Je repousse tout esprit d'accident, les esprits de mort, les épidémies au nom puissant de Jésus. Amen. Pas de marée de gagner tant que nous avons gagné tant que nous avons gagné. The two engines haven't been started for months. Anything goes in the port of Kinshasa. There are no rules and the boats weave in and out in total anarchy. About 10 other boats are hustling around close to the Bear Marni. One month behind schedule, the Bear Marni finally sets off along the river to the passengers' great relief. As it leaves the port, two barges come alongside the ship to form a water convoy. There are now 1,700 people on board, and the Bear Marni has essentially become a floating town. Conditions on board are cramped, to say the least. The first arrivals have set up camp in the middle of the boat. This is virtually first-class accommodation compared to the others who will have to remain seated for the next three weeks with no room to even stretch out. Worse still, some are perched just inches from the edge of the deck. There's no water or electricity on this beast, and each square inch of the ship is taken up as living quarters making it difficult to move around on board. Sometimes 
So go 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 this guy kindly gives us a tour of the ship's pseudo bathroom. It takes balls of steel to even contemplate going for a number two. The River Congo looks calm, almost placid, but looks can be deceiving. The crew are constantly on the lookout for hidden dangers. This river sweeps along debris and tree trunks that could pierce the hull of the ship at any moment. There are no markers and virtually no navigation charts to help the crew, but Captain René knows this river well and is the only person on board who knows exactly where the rocks and shipwrecks are. Le fleuve à Caire, ici qui s'engagne. Vous devez le connaître. Les 1700 km. Vous devez connaître chaque endroit et ses obstacles. Chaque endroit et ses obstacles. There is actually a chart on board, but it hasn't been updated since Belgian colonial days, more than 50 years ago. C'est la carte originale. La carte album original. Depuis l'époque belge. Dans les années 56, comme ça, tous ces signaux ici, ce sont des, bal des balises. Ils étaient visibles, mais pour le moment, ça n'existe pas, c'est disparu. There are no life vests or lifeboats on board this ship. In the Congo, they are not mandatory, even though many ships sink into the depths of the river and hundreds of passengers drown every year. Quand il y a un cas de naufrage, comment peut-on sauver même un minimum de personnes C'est presque trois quarts de personnes qui vont mourir. After five days, the ship has only covered 248 of the 1,000 miles to the final destination. Nobody on board really knows when they'll finally arrive. It might be a week two weeks, or even a month. It's one reason why the passengers refuse to buy a ticket. They need the cash to feed themselves. Every day, river traders climb on to sell supplies. On today's menu are garden vegetables, forest fruits, and fresh fish. But there is rarely enough for everyone. For a few extra Congolese francs, you can even buy monkey meat. Even though the animal is protected and hunting it is forbidden, monkeys are still considered a tasty treat. Marnie and her captain are fighting against a strong current. After a week, they've made only 310 miles. The journey is turning into a long, tedious nightmare. But the delays prove good business for Marie Bonda Bay, an unemployed nurse. The combination of the weather and the worsening sanitary conditions is starting to make people ill. There's no doctor and no sick bay on board. So the captain appoints her the ship's doctor. I'm a passenger, like every person, but I've done my studies 
infirmière. Je suis infirmière A2. J'ai terminé à 2003. J'avais obtenu mon diplôme avec 62%. With her limited medical knowledge, Marie tours the ship looking for the sick. Most on board have never seen, let alone been treated by a doctor. The voyage is particularly hard on the children, especially when the poorest parents give them river water to drink. Mm. Nine days on the river and they are six days behind schedule. So late that those who are sick may not be able to wait for proper medical treatment at the final destination. Captain René has just crossed into the equator region, an invisible border, but one that worries him nonetheless. This potentially rich region is being constantly fought over by armed gangs who want to control its gold and diamond mines. Several boats have been attacked and passengers murdered. On board the Burmani, everyone is tense. Even more so when this human corpse floats down the river. Day 10, and this ratty old boat continues its slow and tedious journey upriver. Every evening, Captain René makes the rounds of his ship to check on his passengers and figure out how much cash he's going to make. He receives a cut of the take and the sleeping passengers piled on top of each other represent a considerable amount of money when they eventually pay their fares at the end of the journey. We accept everyone. We are going to suffer from money. We accept everyone. He presents with his money. That's what makes him have to be transported to the transport. Jusqu'au fond, jusqu'au jusqu plafond. It's three in the morning and Marie the nurse has been urgently summoned. A passenger had his foot caught between the two holes like a vice and his heel has been seriously injured. Marie tries to stitch the wound as best she can. <laughs> Serang <laughs> Ah. 
She managed to stitch him up pretty good, but she's concerned she doesn't have enough antibiotics to last the whole trip. Her main fear is gangrene. Amidst all this blood and gore, there is one happy event. One of the passengers has just given birth to a healthy baby boy. This passenger helped the mother give birth. The mother looks a little bemused. It's been a long, hard journey just getting onto the ship. News of the birth spreads quickly, and so does the camaraderie. During the course of the journey, two more babies will be born. And even if they have seen it all before, the sailors are still touched by the births. Je les vois souvent. Bon, je suis habitué. Je suis très content. In an effort to make up for lost time, Captain René rolls the dice and takes some serious risks. He's decided to carry on sailing at night time along the most dangerous stretch of the river, somewhere he usually navigates only by day. Here the danger is constantly shifting, always on the move. They head into the darkness with a large torch as their only source of light. Despite the strong currents, the pilot has to keep the ship in deep waters in the middle of the river. But the captain is about to make a big mistake. The pilot has lost his course, and without a more powerful beam to light the way, the captain has no way of knowing the ship's position on the river. The ship has just hit a sandbank.
daybreak and the situation is hardly reassuring. Throughout the night, the ship's bow has become totally wedged in the sand. The sailors are willing to try anything. They'll try to separate the barges from the ship in an attempt to manoeuvre. It's a delicate operation. If the water isn't deep enough, the barge could get stuck even more. The town of Bandaka is finally in sight. It marks the halfway stage of the journey. It's taken Captain Rene 12 days to reach this far. It's about the same time it should have taken to reach the final destination. This is where we get off. Fighting is still raging in the region, and the captain, fearful for our safety, asks us to disembark here. The ship will take a month to reach Kisangani. A few weeks later, another ship won't be so lucky. Overloaded, it sinks, and 140 of its passengers drown in the River Congo. <laughs> <laughs> 